So, is human trafficking happening in your neighborhood? Every time I go to speak, I hear one story after another of human trafficking happening in their neighborhood. Uh, very close to here in a very, very, very affluent community, there were three teens going to high school. They kept missing school. They found out it's because they were being trafficked. Newport Beach, California, I was speaking. This woman came up to me and said, I would not believe human trafficking is happening here in my community because the more affluent the community, the safer people feel, right? She said, except the 15-year-old daughter of my best friend ran away to be with one of these guys, and because her mother insisted the police find her right away, usually they'll wait 48 hours, they found that she had used her mother's credit card to buy the bus ticket, and they caught her trying to cross the state line to be, to be with one of these guys. If they had not acted immediately, she never would have been seen again. I just was speaking in Long Beach yesterday, two days ago, at a school, a girl, was pulled screaming into a white van and drove away. And this is why. For any kid under 20, a trafficker can make over half a million dollars a year. Over half a million, so they are ridiculously aggressive. To them, this is a business. They have their own social networks. They have their own sites. They train each other. They have training manuals on how to trick kids. Like that, this has become a cottage industry. We have kids on skateboards, 19 years old, pimping out their girlfriends. Because it's so lucrative. You can go to YouTube and download a video that says Pimping 101 that will tell you exactly how to set up your business. So this is why it's growing. The other reason why it's growing so fast and why the police are predicting it'll be bigger than drugs in two to three years in LA is because not only is it ridiculously lucrative, it's much harder to convict a trafficker than if you have drugs. If you have drugs in your car, it's an automatic conviction, right? They go by how many ounces. If you have an underage teen in your car who's dressed provocatively, they can't do a thing. They have to prove a money trail from the victim to the pimp or the trafficker to convict them. Or they need a cooperative witness, and given they've terrorized their victims, that's very tough. So they're less likely to get caught, and it's more lucrative, which is why it's growing. Now, can we win? Yes. If we collaborate, if we raise enough awareness, we can win. The problem is they're ahead of us. They have collaborated. The gangs have given up their rivalries to get into this business because it's so lucrative. They're collaborating. They have their own social networks. We're way behind. We need to catch up. And that's the purpose of this presentation is to raise awareness. And I expect you all to be advocates and get out there and tell people, get speakers to come, whatever we need to do. We need to get ahead of this. OK, so let's define what is human trafficking. Human trafficking is obtaining or maintaining the labor or services of another person through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. With a minor, law enforcement does not need to prove force, fraud, or coercion in order to convict. In other words, if the individual is 18 years or older, they have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. Otherwise, their handler is convicted of pimping, which is only a few weeks in jail. It is a misdemeanor to have sex with a prostitute 18 years or older. It's a misdemeanor. It's a felony if they're under 18. But the buyers can always say they didn't know she was under 18, right? So then it becomes a misdemeanor for the buyer. Now, with a minor, it's a, it's a felony. You don't need to prove force, fraud, or coercion. It's an automatic, like that. So this is where, honestly, law enforcement is focusing and why my presentation focuses on this, because this is where we're getting action, the most action. Not to say I don't care about the other victims. So uh, the US Department of Justice tells us that in the US, human trafficking is the second largest and fastest growing illegal enterprise in the US because of how lucrative it is and the difficulty of prosecution. 82% is sex trafficking, because that's where the money is. And who's at risk is our children. 100,000 kids under the age of 18 are currently victims of human trafficking in the US, with 300,000 being at risk. These are statistics are from the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and I've met with them, and they told me these statistics are very conservative. 
So like any business model with human trafficking, there's supply, demand, and the middleman. Sorry, who's the trafficker? Now, you don't want to go out and try to rescue victims because to the trafficker, you are stealing half a million dollars from them. They will kill you. And there are churches who have tried to do that. Do not do that. You need to learn to recognize what human trafficking looks like and know when to call the police. And when you call the police, you need to say, I saw a minor being trafficked. Then they'll come because it's a felony. If you say, I saw a woman being trafficked, if they don't have a higher priority that day, they'll come. But again, it's a misdemeanor, so it's important to know that. So we can help the police catch the trafficker by n teaching our communities what trafficking looks like. In affluent communities, where they're doing trafficking is luxury apartment complexes. Because the more money in that community, the less likely people think trafficking is happening next door to them. All they see are businessmen in suits and ties coming and going at lunch and after work. And they can easily lie about that. They can say they're selling men's skincare products, right? Except people have called the police and the police have investigated and they have shut them down. All right, so let's talk about how trafficking occurs. People ask me all the time, they go, Susan, what happened? We've always had prostitution. What happened that there's this explosion of demand? The answer is porn hit the internet, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we now have a porn pandemic. And according to brain science studies, porn is 100 times more addicting than heroin. And like any drug, people will pay anything to satisfy their drug craving. So we have a huge demand. And what happens when a user is at a porn site, there's pop-ups, and the pop-ups say, click here for a more exciting site and they're taken to violent sites with younger and younger victims, and they know that the women they know would not do half the things they saw, and then there's a pop-up of a woman's face saying she would love to do everything they just saw. They click on that pop-up, and they're taken to an escort site where there is a drop-down menu. And from the drop-down menu, they can choose a victim by sex, hair color, bus size, age, race, whatever they want, and according to the LA police, they can have a client meet within one hour. Now, most people, when they think of human trafficking, they're thinking streetwalkers, right? Streetwalkers is human trafficking oftentimes, but that's the low end. It's not as lucrative as this. This is where the people who have money go, and this is where the and because it's done this way, it's invisible. So people look around their communities and they see, okay, we don't have streetwalkers here, we don't have human trafficking. No, it's happening online. It's invisible to our communities. The pimp's sense of ownership is obscene. They will brand their victims, they will use barcodes so every pimp knows who owns who. And people ask me, they go, why do these women allow themselves to be raped 15 times a day? The answer is they will torture them if they do not meet quota or if the client complains. And I mean torture, I mean burn, cut, you name it. And these victims feel trapped, so they put up with it. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about protecting our children, reducing the demand for sex and labor trafficking, and what our community can do. So traffickers are in chat rooms, social networking sites, gaming sites. When they're playing a game with a child, they will use voice changing software so they sound like a kid. I was doing this presentation for a Seroptimus Club and this woman told me her eight-year-old son was playing with a 10-year-old girl who sent him pictures of her breast. You have to trust me on this. He was not talking to a 10-year-old girl. That, by the way, is child porn. They get boys to send them pictures of themselves, of the naked photos, and then they post those pictures with their contact information and that kid will get the most disgusting invites to have sex you have ever seen in your life. And they can never get it off those sites, ever. They have to change their contact information. The problem is they don't know how to tell their parents. So they start getting depressed and acting out because they have this big secret and they can't tell their parents, which is why it's really important we educate everyone so kids know that we know this is going on so they can talk and speak up. Now, the traffickers know you have told your children, do not talk to strangers and do not tell anyone where you live. Well, in their mind, they're not talking to a stranger. They sound like a kid, an, like another teenager. By the way, they just Google teenager and post that picture and say that's who they are. 
and they never ask them where they live because they know they'll be suspicious. They don't need to ask that anymore. All they need to do is say, let's friend each other on a social network, and once they have access to their pictures, using geotagging, they can find out exactly where they live down to the room in the house. And anyone can go to YouTube. By the way, this video is two minutes. I looked at it. I downloaded the software. I can take any picture and find out exactly where it was taken. So they're at gaming sites. Now, a lot of parents allow their kids to be on the internet to kids sit their kids. Do not do that. They will post pop-ups at game sites like Nickelodeon or Disney or whatever, and they click on the pop-up and they're taken to predator sites. I'm not saying Nickelodeon has those pop-ups. The predators know how to put pop-ups at kids' sites. Do not let your kids get on the internet. So they're in modeling chat rooms, posing as agent. In one case, this guy told this 12-year-old that he had made all these models famous. She's 12. She doesn't know and sucked her in. They're in every place teens hang out. You know, clubs, swap meets, movies, malls. Now, they know that you think a trafficker looks like a sleazy looking guy. They know that. So they oftentimes use women, especially in malls, well-dressed women offering kids jobs. And when they show up for the interview, it's human trafficking. Unless your child is interviewing for a known entity like Starbucks or Best Buy, you should go on that interview with that kid. If you have not heard of that, I don't care if they have a website. Anyone can have a website. Women with low self-esteem are easy targets. So we have interviewed the pimps, and we know how they fish for victims. So in malls, what they do is they'll go up to a girl and say, you are beautiful. And if that girl looks them in the eye and says, thank you, and keeps walking, she has just let them know she is too much work to be tricked and they'll leave her alone. If she looks down and says, no, I'm not, they will be on her like white on rice. Wow. <laughs> too much. So we all know about the Romeo pimp online being tricked by promises of romance. By the way, these guys, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, actually, I'll talk about it now. One of the things we found, in de especially dealing with teens, is these guys are con artists, and they're running several different victims at once. Now, the way you are a con artist is you always agree with the person. So if they like vanilla, you love vanilla, right? But they give out very little information because they need to keep their lies straight, and that's hard if you're talking to six different people, right? So if your teenager is in love with one of these victims, or, uh, excuse me, in love with someone online, or you know even a 40-year-old who's in love with someone online, you ask them, where do they go to school? What do they want to do with their life? How many brothers and sisters do they have? What do their family like to do when they were growing up? They will find out they know next to nothing. All right, gangs use guerrilla pimping techniques to obtain victims. It's what I talked about in the beginning. Guerrilla pimping means force. There's no trickery involved, it's just plain force. They go up to these women and they say, we're gonna kill your family if you don't do everything we tell you to do. If you hear, if someone ever, you need to tell your kids, and if they, anyone ever says that, they need to immediately call the police. Because they will say, if they say anything, they're gonna kill their family, it doesn't matter. They need to call the police. We can't let them take over and intimidate our neighborhoods like that. So what's an overtired parent to do? The main thing is you need to make sure your children are not talking to strangers. And it's very popular to be talking to strangers now. I talk to school administrators and these apps like the Kick app are sweeping the campuses. What they're doing is they're sexting, which is they're having sex by text with strangers. And for a teen, it's all about attention. So they'll, by the way, the Kick app is just a social media app. This just happens to be popular, so the predators are trying to find teens to talk to through it. Kick did not design it for predators, just so you know. They're just using it. So a teen's at school, and they have a crowd around them, and the teen says, oh my God, look what he just said to me. And then they go, go what are you going to say back? And it's a contest to see who can be the raunchiest. And it's, it's having our kids not like that. So you need to tell your kids, by the way, a lot of parents say, how do I make sure there's privacy settings on my kids' social media apps? It's easy. You do what the kids do. You go to YouTube and Google 
how to set privacy settings on Kik, how to block porn on an iPhone 5. They'll give you a step-by-step -step video. And if your kids don't have privacy settings on their apps, you need to ask them why, and they need to get it on. If they don't keep it on, you need to take their phone away. You don't ever want your kids talking to strangers. There's 52 million predators out there, according to the FBI. They are after these kids. They can, don't forget, they can make half a million dollars a year. They are on it. So also, don't buy your children games with nudity or sexual content. You can stay on top of everything. If it says nudity or sexual content, it is so obscene you can't even imagine. This game sold 1.3 billion in the first three days. In this game, you have first person virtual sex with a prostitute and at the end, in order to get your money back, and by the way, you use real money, Microsoft points, real money, $50. In order to get your money back, you kill her. And 10-year-olds are playing this game. If it says nudity or sexual content, do not buy that game. Just don't buy it. All right, boys are victimized through child porn. I talked about this before. We have people like this. He Googles beautiful girl, sends it to a teen, Googles breasts, sends that picture to the teen, says, now I want to see yours. And then they become victims of child porn. Now, let me tell you the easiest way to talk to your kids. NetSmarts, which is a website hosted by the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, this is the best I've seen. You go there and they have three categories. They have teens, tweens, and kids. And they have three minute videos, two and a half minute videos. What's the attention span of an average kid? Right? And they are awesome. I can't even tell you how awesome they are. They have actual kids talking about having been tricked and how they were texted 50 times a day. And then when you're done, you just go and you say, okay, uh, then you can talk about the things I talked about. Privacy settings, thank you. And we're gonna talk about the recruiters and Romeo pimps. Romeo is the boyfriend. I think of you every minute of every day. You're the love of my life. All life. Right, we're gonna talk about um, uh, recruiters in a minute. So how do you talk to a lovesick teen? I, ta I referred to this before. Your first inclination when you find out that your child is in love with someone online, a stranger is to be horrified, right? Now, if you say, oh my God, he's probably a predator like that, and they're madly in love, what do you think happens? Rebellion. Yes, the rebellion is right. You need to put on your actor and actress hat, and you need to say, really, tell me about him. He texts you 50 times a day? Wow, he sounds like he's really into you. I'm so happy you found someone who cares about you that much. By the way, where does he go to school? Who's his family? You know, things like that. Then you start to plant doubt. In one case, Opal Singleton, who's a friend of mine, this uh, mother, panic mother came to her. She talks to a lot of parents whose teens are being groomed. She actually wrote a book. I'll show you in a second. And she said, my daughter got a plane ticket to go to Ireland, and I can't stop her. She's 18, she's going, I'm scared to death. And she said, fine, this is what you tell her. She, you tell her, if you love him, we'll love him. Instead of going to Ireland, let's cash the ticket in and we'll pay for a ticket to come here so we can meet him. Of course, he never showed. So if you, he sounds awesome. If you love him, we'll love him. Let's meet. As soon as the trafficker gets wind that, the, that that teen is bonded to their family and they're going to have to show up, they will drop that kid like a hot potato. All right, so this is the book, Seduce, and that's um, also in my flyer. Um, now let's look at our three main lines of defense. The first is our schools. First, I'm going to go here and I'm going to come back. The trafficker, a tattooed up 30-year-old guy, cannot walk onto a school campus. They know that. So they recruit teens to do their work for them. And since teens are so sexualized now, they go up to teens and they go, you're already doing it. You might as well get paid for it. I'm doing it. Girls will tell. By the way, the most likely recruiter is a girl. And they will make friends with your kids just like the Romeo pimp does. You're awesome. They will become their BFF and suck them in. 
Except, this is what you need to tell your teen, only 1% of victims are ever rescued, only 1%. And any trafficking victim will be dead in less than seven years. From AIDS, being beaten to death or whatever. If you're having sex with 15 different guys a day, it's only a matter of time before you get AIDS, especially given who these buyers are. And they pay more if you're not using a condom. You need to really scare them. These are facts. These are not, I did not my opinion. Dead in less than seven years. So the next time they say, okay, uh, you know, the other per people are being tricked are the teens, especially teenage boys. They were given $20 for every $100 the girls made. Does that sound like such a bad thing? And they're already doing it anyway? Except if they're 18 or over, they can get up to 15 years in prison. And they don't know that. So we need to make sure they know that. So let me go back here. I'm going to talk about one of my heroines in this fight. Janae Luttrell is married to police officers, so she knew that there must be a recruiter on every school campus, and the police are telling me that. They know there's a recruiter on every school campus. So one of her dilemmas was, because of privacy laws, probation, who probably knew who the recruiters were, and social services, who probably knew who the victims were, could not share information with the school. So she went to the Department of Education, she asked to do a study where everyone shared information. In 2010, without the information sharing, they identified 17 victims. In 2011, with the information sharing, they identified 300 victims. The youngest was 10. Now this is the good news. In identifying that many victims, they found out who their recruiters were. And in finding the recruiters, they found who the traffickers were. They made so many arrests. In some cases with the recruiters, they just expelled them. They didn't have enough evidence. They made so many arrests that social media blew up with the traffickers telling their recruiters to get out of that school district. Right after all the arrests were made, they had scores of teens transferring out of their school district who were probably recruiters they hadn't found. In the city of San Diego, it is known among the trafficking community that Grossmont High School District is not where you want to do business because you're going to get caught. We need that stand in every school district. We do that by raising awareness. We need to wake up. We're asleep. Okay, so we need a teen or young adult human trafficking club on every school campus. They can put out flyers when victims were asked why they did not run away. They said they could not get help. You can put out those flyers, but honestly with the teen, they do not identify as a human trafficking victim. They identify themselves as a girlfriend of some guy. So we need to talk to where they live. So here's a poster I put together. It doesn't matter how many times your boyfriend says I love you, if he wants to have sex for money, he's using you. We need to talk to him like this. By the way, you can download this poster uh, from my site. There's plenty of resources for teachers. This one right here, Human Trafficking America Schools at the Department of Education website is Janae Luttrell's complete study. It's awesome. Um, there's also programs that youth pastors can use. I Empathize has one, A21 has one. Another line of defense is our health professionals. Now, the traffickers do not care if their victims are sick and don't feel well. They do not send them to a doctor. They don't care about them. However, the clients want clean girls. And because of what they're doing, they get STDs all the time. So as a result, it's estimated between 85% to 100% of victims will see a health professional. Yet only 3% of health professionals know how to recognize a victim. Clearly, we have work to do. We need to raise awareness. We need training. Here's places where you can get training. It's on the flyer I'm going to hand out. So let's look at reducing the demand for sex trafficking. The average age a kid is first exposed to porn is eight. And they're all looking at it on their cell phones. You need to block it. The problem is if you block it, their friend they're sitting next to will just hand them their cell phone. You need to get all the parents together that your kids hang out with and all agree that you're all going to block it. The other thing you need to do is you need to move the Wi-Fi into your bedroom and turn it off at night and take away their cell phones so they have no internet access at night because when a hardcore porn user is looking at porn is all night. It's also when the predators are soliciting your kids. It's not gonna keep them from doing it but it will seriously limit it. 
Okay, we need to incorporate talks on the dangers of port addiction to our Boy Scouts. Here's a great resource for young children. It's called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. This is on my flyer. If you have young children in case they accidentally come across it. Fight the new drug has studies to discourage uh, on brain science. Teens will listen to brain science. And what they found is this, and by the way, this is interesting, in April Time Magazine, it says the exact same thing and we need to raise awareness. What happens is after watching hundreds of hours of porn, it creates neural path, every time you do anything, it creates a neural pathway in your brain. You create enough neural pathways, the brain's so elastic because we're designed to adapt, it changes the brain. So if you've watched hundreds of hours of violent porn, what happens is the user will become impotent unless the sex is violent. And Fight the New Drug does talk to schools and they have 15 year olds telling them they're impotent. In Time Magazine, they had all these 20 year olds talking about it, how they're impotent from being addicted to porn. See, if we raise awareness regarding that, do you think that might discourage people? It just might. It just might. It's a drug and it will ruin your sex life. That's, we need men's groups to be talking this up. Sorry about that. Here's a great video. What it shows is that the actors and actresses in porn videos are often victims of human trafficking. They are not enjoying it. It's all a lie. We need to destroy the fantasy. So we also need to speak up. There's a genre of porn called barely legal porn where they take short, skinny, 18-year-olds, put pigtails on them and have them talk and act like they're 14 and act in a porn video only they're the seductress. Now what idea is that giving people? Verizon Fios was showing those videos with titles like Pigtailed Teens Pounded. But enough people complain they stop. We need to speak up. We actually have more power than the government because of our buying power. A company like Verizon is very concerned about their brand. They can't afford to lose loyalty of their following or have people being critical. They will stop. We need to speak up. So let's look at reducing the demand for labor trafficking. By the way, I know I'm going really fast and I know I'm overwhelming you. I know that, just so you know. I know that, but we have a lot to cover. And again, this video is at my website. I have a whole book. You can even get it for free. All right, so. We do have labor trafficking. If you see anyone working 24 seven, they're a victim of labor trafficking. That's just the bottom line. So I was doing this presentation and a Homeland Security agent was doing it with me and this woman at the end uh, asked questions. She raised her hand and said, I know about this and every time I see my mother at the retirement home, the same people are working there no matter what day I go, no matter what hour of the day. I said, and I asked them why they're doing that, and they said, we're required to work double shifts. And I said, I would call the police, because for all you know, they were told to say that. And the Homeland Security agent agreed with me. He said, call the police. 24 seven, in another case, this woman next door to retirement home noticed that the workers never left to go home. Big fat red sign. All right, if something doesn't look right, you call this number, it's on my flyer. Uh, the, by the way, two-thirds of all human trafficking in the world is labor trafficking. And who's creating the demand is you and me. Because of the countries in the world, China is the most populated, then India, then us, and we have the money. And in India and China, slave labor is somewhat legal. People assume that because slavery is illegal in this country, we don't allow slave-made products in our country. That is not true. Anything imported could be made by slaves. If it's imported you, and it's a food product, you want to make sure it says fair trade, like your coffee, tea, and sugar. Okay, now, free to work, this, they are awesome. They're going to tell you who uses slaves and who doesn't. At my table, which I haven't had a chance to set up, I have these reports. I know you can't see them, but you can see who's doing what. Just briefly, they have six standards. The apparel industry, they show you. By the way, if you're Fruit of the Loom users, you're good. They get a B. <laughs> a lot of the teen clothes, they're getting Fs, all made by slaves. Electronics industry, no one got an A. Amazon Kindle has an F, made by slaves. Until 2012, every Apple product was made by slaves. And people complain so much, they now have a grade of B. They put in social media, this is what people were doing constantly. 
So they stopped. Again, we need to speak up. You have tremendous power. You need to use it. Okay, the other thing is with uh, climate change, and the why I even have this here, people go, what is this about? One, the Pope's very interested in it, but with regard to human trafficking, in the third world, it's getting too hot to grow food in many places. As a result, families are selling their oldest child so the rest of the family can eat. The production of animal protein produces more greenhouse gases than all the cars in the world. So if you eat less meat, you're actually helping fight human trafficking. Just so you know. All right, so let's look at the supply. And I have Sister uh, Farrell here who's going to talk for Covenant House in just a minute. But you should know in the U.S., once a kid ages out of the system, if they don't have a family to go to, we shake their hand, we congratulate them on becoming emancipated, and we drop them off at a temporary shelter. And who's right there waiting for them are the gangs, the pornographers, and the human traffickers. Within 48 hours, one out of three will be approached. Within a week, they'll all be approached. This is what happens to the kids who do not get a good foster parent or adoptive parent who do not have a good mentor. My main focus when I go rock around churches is I recruit mentors, foster parents, and like that because there is one church in the U.S. for each child in the foster care system, one entire church. And yet only 25% of those who are available for adoption get adopted because these kids are invisible. We need to make them visible. We need to have someone come once a year to your parishes and do a talk and recruit. All right. Not only are 60% of trafficking victims from the foster care system, 70% of the people in prison are from the foster care system. We could reduce our uh, prison's uh, population in half if we started actively recruiting. Here's an outreach to the community to encourage adoption, mentoring. Every kid in the foster care system needs a mentor. 70% are going to go back to their biological family. But they'll go from their family to a foster family, back to their family, then to a group home, back to their family, then another group home. They need a mentor who's going to provide stability throughout that process. Here I have this. There is FIAT, is Faith Initiative Abolish Trafficking. That's an LA group where it's for the faith community to come get training and network on what they're doing to fight trafficking within their own churches. It's fabulously empowering. So what can you do? Can we win in the fight against human trafficking? Yes, if everyone takes action. Go down to the city hall, have them include what does human trafficking look like as part of their neighborhood watch. A lot of cities are doing that. Invite a speaker. Um, volunteer with Covenant House. Stand up for kids who are going out to find homeless teens, which are also a major victim. Be creative with your gifts. If you're a hair cutter, you could do a day where 25% of the profits go to a organization that's fighting trafficking or like Covenant House. I wrote this book because so many people told me they could not get their friends to read this book because it's too dark a subject. This one. So I have a talent is I cook organic and I know how to do it cheap. And so I wrote this book and in this book, 15 minute healthy organic meals for less than $10 a day. I talk about labor trafficking and how a lot of our food is made by slaves and people need to buy fair trade. And I talk about climate change and all kinds of stuff. And this book outsells my human trafficking book five to one. So use your gifts. And last but not least, we need to pray. Everyone's familiar with the song Amazing Grace, but what many are not familiar with is that John Newton, who wrote that song, was an 18th century human trafficker, a slave trader who had been raised in the faith, but when he became a bad guy, he gave up, you know, anything doing with God, most bad guys do, except when he was faced with a storm at sea, he told God if God would save his life, he would change his ways. And the seas became calm. And John did change his ways. And he was instrumental in helping Wilberforce and trafficking in England. To go from a slave trader to helping and trafficking, only God can do that. We need our prayer warriors. So yes, we can win if everyone does their part. This is my website. This is my book. We're going to pass up the flyers. What I'd like you all to do is just take a couple of minutes to share back and forth before I have Sister Margaret come up and just share what you saw. One thing you're going to do, just share back and forth. You want to come up? 